Good Tuesday evening, Canada. How are you doing out there? Hope you had a fantastic weekend of football, and thank you for listening to another episode of Rouge Radio. I, of course, am your host, Tyler Bieber, and for the next 30 minutes, we are going to have our weekly CIS and CJFL show for you. And up first on the program coming up here in a couple minutes is going to be James Katsuras. And James is the Deputy Chief Editor at SportsA. And last week we had Kent Ridley on the program, and Kent talked to us a little bit about what sport, Sports A is all about. And, of course, Sports A is also a division of top prospects and Ridley scouting, which helps promote football and sports in general at the next level and helping these kids get to the next level and being identified out there. And uh, we're going to have a great chat about CIS. Um, lots going on this past week, especially in the OUA, where Western – ended a 12-game home losing streak of the McMaster Marauders. 58-15. Blowout. How about that? Western improved to 3-0 on the season, and McMaster struggling in the early bit here. They are 1-2. And uh, the defending OUA champions are down in the standings right now. Ottawa defeated Toronto 34 to 10, and Ottawa improved to 2 and 1 with the win, while Toronto dropped to 1 and 2. Uh, Queens defeated Windsor 49-34. Queens is now 3 and 0 on the season, joining Western atop the OUA standings, while Windsor dropped to 1 and 2. York defeated Laurier, and that was the first time Laurier had a nine-game winning streak over York, and York snapped it. And now Laurier has lost back-to-back games to York and to the Toronto Varsity Blues. And uh, in a little bit when James joins me here, I'm going to get his take on that and how a team like Laurier, they have made 10 consecutive playoff appearances in the OUA. 10 in a row. They won a Vanier Cup over that span as well. And how a team like that can lose to two teams. Now, you, you don't want to say that they're – outright bad teams because they clearly have been able to win these games, but teams that haven't won a lot of football games over the course of the past few years. And uh, it'll be interesting to see his take on that and how Laurier can help improve their program going forward here as they are now 0-3 on the season. Uh, Waterloo beat Carlton. Carlton had their first home game of the season. They came back into the football program after 15 years away from the sport, and Waterloo beat them 47-8. to Last week, Kent Ridley figured that perhaps Carlton would be a little bit more competitive against Waterloo, and they, they scored more points, but uh, they still struggled a little bit there, and they are now 0-2 on the season, and Guelph had a bye. And so we're going to bring in James here now. And uh, James, you are the Deputy Chief Editor at Sportsay, and uh, the, our fans can follow you at J Katsuras, that's J K A T S U R A S. They can also follow Sports Day at Sports Day. And uh, I want to thank you for joining me. And how are you doing this evening? I'm doing great, Tyler. Uh, thanks for having me on the show. I really appreciate it. No problem. Uh, last week, I was just mentioning that we had Kent Ridley on the show, and he was talking to us a little bit about CIS football and Sports Day and the things going on with Sports Day and what you guys are trying to do. And uh, I just wanted to get a little bit better of an understanding as to what your role is within the company. Right. Well, I'm basically, I'm the deputy chief editor, but I'm also responsible for our content. So I distribute the article assignments to our writers. I edit the work. And on top of that, I also act as kind of a sideline reporter, I guess you could say, where I conduct interviews with players and coaches at OVFL games and recently on our OEWA road trip. So, yeah. Awesome. Uh, So we're going to go right into it here, and I was just doing a little bit of a recap of the OUA games, but uh, we're going to go back to Western. They did the 12-game home win streak of McMaster, and uh, it was a blowout, 58-15. And Western's quarterback, Will Finch, he completed 26 passes on 35 attempts in the game for 449 yards and five touchdowns. And uh, I wanted to get your take on Finch. Now, Many people are high on him and believe he could break the barrier to become the next quality Canadian quarterback in the CFL. And uh, I wanted to know what your thoughts were on his play and his potential moving forward. Well, here's the thing with Finch. The kid's done nothing but impress me ever since 
I started watching him. I mean, obviously, he was the number one quarterback recruit coming out of the country when he went to Nelson. They won the Golden Horseshoe Championship in 2011. But people didn't know, you know, how he would do right away. Obviously, Donnie Marshall got injured last year, so he got thrown into the fire. But, you know, he did very well. But he lost, actually, to McMaster in the playoffs where he threw four interceptions. So he kind of avenged himself in this game. But the thing with the pinch is that I think he works he works harder than most other quarterbacks do. Like, he has the gifts, but he also works hard. He has the prototype size. He's 6'3", 215. But I talked to Greg Marshall, and he told me that he spent the entire offseason in the weight room putting on weight, studying film. So he's just as prepared as any other kid. And you don't know if he's going to beat you through the air or on the ground. I mean, when they played Toronto, he had 80 yards rushing in that touchdown. And in this game, you figured, okay, maybe he's going to run because McMaster has that all-Canadian secondary where he threw four picks. But what does he do? He barely ran. They had less than 100 yards rushing from San Vito. He torched them for almost 500 yards and all those touchdowns. So that's just phenomenal. I think this kid, more than any other kid, has a legitimate chance to make the CFL. I really do. Now, McMaster lost their second straight game. Uh, last week they were dumped on the road by Queen. And I, I'm curious to know your thoughts on their early season troubles. They're now sitting at one and two down in the standings. Are they in trouble here, or are they going to be able to find their game coming up here against a couple lighter opponents and be able to start getting going here in 2013? Right. Well, you just said it right there, Tyler. Uh, nobody's had a tougher schedule than McMaster so far. They faced a good Ottawa team in the first game that they won, they they played really well against. And then they faced the number two ranked team, Queens, the number three ranked team, Western. You know what I mean? It doesn't get any tougher than that. And Queens, a lot of people would say that they should have won that game. It was at Queens. Uh, they had, what, seven turnovers that game, two pick sixes, right? So that's a game they could have won. And then they faced a juggernaut of a Western team. Now, the pollsters have accordingly not overreacted. As you can see, they're still ranked ninth in the country by the CIS. And as you mentioned, they're facing York, Guelph, Waterloo, Laurier, and Carleton from here on in. So 6-2 and two or 5-3 and three is very realistic from here on out. They'll make the playoffs. They won't get that by. But I think after losing guys like Bagelar, Quinlan, people weren't expecting them to just blow through the OUA again. So I think, I think McMaster will be okay. Uh, next up, York. They defeated Laurier 33-20, to and that ended Laurier's nine-game winning streak over York. Uh, Laurier has now lost back-to-back games, one to Toronto and one to York. And I was just curious to know what you thought about Laurier's – they're on a 10-year run of playoff appearances here. Is that in jeopardy, or are they going to be able to bounce back a little bit? They're obviously going to have some tougher games coming up. How how much are these two losses to York and Toronto going to hurt them? Right. Well, the thing with Laurier is, as you said, like they've been one of the top programs – recently. The, I mean, Coach Jeffries is a legend, right? But the thing with Laurie is it just got a little stale. The last couple of seasons weren't too good. So they bring in a new coach, breathe in a new life into the program, Michael Folds, and this is a rebuilding year for them any way you look at it. Toronto and York haven't been good in recent years, but they're in different stages of their development. They have veteran coaches. York has Warren Craney. Toronto has Greg Gary. They're expected to win this year. You know what I mean? So I don't think, uh, I don't think it's a telling of where, where this program is going over the next couple of years. Uh, Coach Fold said himself that they can go 8-0, and they can go 0-8 or anywhere in between this season, but the important thing is that they compete. So all he's doing is he's establishing a culture with the team so that in years to come, they're, they're going to be competitive again. And I said it myself, if you're going to get Laurier, get him this year or get him next year because I really do think he's going to be able to get him back to that upper echelon sooner rather than later. So sticking with York now, they play Toronto on October 10th in the annual Red and Blue Bowl. And there's a question here on Twitter, and it actually comes from Sports Day's account. And mm-hmm. they want to know who you think is going to win this game. If I had to pick a winner? Right. Well, I think it's going to be a really, really good game. I think both teams really want this one. I think York has the benefit of a more experienced quarterback with Miles Gibbon, which is really going to make a difference. I think UFT has the better defense. I think they have a more veteran group. UFT has great wide receivers. They have DePass and Pershalski. They do have a first-year quarterback. It's Honestly, I think it's going to be an, an amazing game. I think it's going to be close. I think it's going to be back and forth. And to pick a winner, honestly, I think at this point is a toss-up. I could see it go either way. Were you a? I, I think I read that you were a graduate, graduate, excuse me, of the University of Toronto. Is that true? 
That's correct, yeah. So you have a little bit of an impact in your prediction there, or maybe? Well, I, I maybe mean, I, obviously it influences you a little bit, right? I have a little bit of blue and white pride in me. Of course, you know, it, it would be nice to see them win. But speaking objectively, uh, I think York's a very strong team. Uh, I think they're coming off a big win. And, I, I mean, I, I, I would want to pick Toronto outright, but I honestly could see this go either way. All right, so Carlton played their first home game this past week. They, they're in their second week now back on the football field. And last week I asked Kent Ridley how long he felt it would take for Carlton to produce results on the field. Now, that's not necessarily perhaps a win, but at least right. keep trying to keep it close and competitive. And uh, I wanted to get your take on that too as to when what the timeline here is for Carlton to – to produce some on-field results, you know, keep games a little bit close and be a little bit more competitive. Right. Well, I think right off the bat, uh, on-field results will not be reflected in the scoreline. I think if you're expecting, you know, them to keep teams, like, within, like, 20 and 30 points, it's just not going to happen this year. That doesn't necessarily mean that they aren't progressing and then they're not doing well. It's just realistically you can't expect kids right out of high school because that's what they are, right? This is an expansion team. You can't expect kids right out of high school, especially in a sport like football, to be able to contend with these OUA teams. I mean, they're just not big enough physically. They need to mature. So I think the important thing for Carlton is to just, you know, dip their feet, get their feet a little wet, see what it's like playing in the OUA. They have the veteran coach from St. Mary's and Steve Samara. They have a good veteran quarterback also from St. Mary's, Jesse Mills, right? And they just they need to baptize these younger players. They need to see what it's like. And I honestly, I, I do believe it'll take at least two or three years for them to be competitive. I don't, I, I could see them maybe winning a game this year, but even that would be a stretch. I think it would take at least two or three years for them to start competing. Conference play began in the Atlantic Conference this past week, and Acadia is the back-to-back champion, but they lost to St. Mary's 14-11. to and it's their first conference loss since 2011. And is it, a, is it a sign of what could happen this season? Is Acadia in a little bit of trouble in terms of the conference play, or are they going to be able to stick it out and once again take the conference? Oh, I absolutely think it's a sign of what's going to happen in conference play. Not to say that Acadia isn't good and you know won't be able to win it again. I think it's going to be more wide open between them and St. Mary's. They lost Kyle Graves, two-time AUS MVP. They lost Michael Squires, all-Canadian wide receiver. They lost three guys on the O-line. It's to be expected. It's the same thing that happened to McMaster, right? You can't stay on top forever when these guys graduate. And then St. Mary's has the transfer quarterback from Western, Ben Rosong, right? They have their you know two good running backs. They have the top linemen in the AUS and Rob Jubinville. So it didn't surprise me at all. In fact, all three of us at Sports A picked St. Mary's to be Acadia, not not as an indictment of what we think of Acadia, but just, you know, we feel that St. Mary's is a strong team. They're playing at home, and I think it's going to be a toss-up between the two of them in the AUS this year. Other game in the Atlantic Conference this week was St. FX. They beat Mount Allison 31-10. to Moving on to the Quebec Conference, McGill beat Concordia 32-19. to McGill is now 1-1 one one on the season, and Concordia is 0-2. Montreal and Laval both improved to 2-0 as Montreal beat Bishops 44-18, and Laval shut out Sherbrooke 20-0. And we'll move on to the Canada West here as an interesting game in Winnipeg at Investors Group Field. Saskatchewan defeated Manitoba 36-34. It was a back-and-forth game. The Huskies made a little bit of an interesting call late in the game. They went for a third and goal at the one situation. They went for it instead of kicking a field goal. That would have given them the lead. It still would have left on over a minute on the clock. But uh, what was your take on Saskatchewan's decision to go for it on third and goal at the one rather than kick an easy field goal and take a late lead? Right. Well, I mean, it's easy for, you know, someone like me to sit here and second guess, uh, you know, a legendary coach like Coach Taurus. But the thing is, I think this is the mentality that Saskatchewan has to have if they want to overthrow Calgary this year. I think this is the year they can do it, and I think it's the year they will do it, especially with Calgary's quarterback situation. So I think with Saskatchewan, I think this was them sending a message. They want to, you know what I mean? They want to go for it. They want to go for the jugular. And And I like that. I mean, it could have bit them in the butt, but... They got lucky. They came back. They won the game, last-second uh, victory. And, uh, you know, we, we would have been second-guessing them until the Cows came home had they lost. But they won. 
and they showed that killer instinct, and I like that. Right. Now, the last second victory, it was a little bit controversial because Manitoba got the ball back after the Huskies. The Huskies forced Manitoba to punt. They got the ball back. They eventually kicked the game-winning field goal. And then Manitoba was able to drive down the field. And a pass that apparently left one second left on the clock in the eyes of, Manit- of, the, of the Manitoba Bisons, but it wasn't so as the clock ran out. Um, have you you know, noticed anything in terms of that controversial ending. Is there something that could be done to maybe fix that in the future? See, the thing I find with uh, Canadian football, it, it, there's always that ambiguity when it comes to the clock because with the NFL, it always stops, right? It stops when the, the ball hits the ground when it's out of bounds, whereas with Canada, sometimes it runs, it doesn't. And it's interesting because they were playing in Manitoba too, so you'd, you'd think that they'd get the home discount on that one. But it's just one of those things. Unless unless they change the rules with the clock, I think it's going to happen. And if you're Manitoba, obviously it stings, but that's why, like they say, you shouldn't leave it to the refs, right, at the end of the game because anything could happen. Now, you just mentioned the Calgary-Saskatchewan factor in the Canada West, and Eric Dulesky is out with a broken foot. And I wanted to get your take on how it's going to affect them, A, in the game coming up against Saskatchewan this upcoming week, and how it has changed possibly what Calgary has tried to do in the past two victories that they have had in the season. Well, surprisingly, I'm, I'm, I'm surprised that I'm saying this, but it won't change too much from what they've been doing just because their star running back, Mercer Timmons, has been so unbelievable. He has 245 rush yards, five touchdowns. In the game uh, this past week, he had 139 yards, two touchdowns. So they've been really heavily leaning on him. And backup quarterback Andrew Buckley didn't look too bad either. So obviously, I mean, it, it's going to obviously affect him. I mean, he's a star quarterback. He's a veteran player. He's a leader. And especially against a team like Saskatchewan, who's on fire right now, we'll see what happens. I mean, that'll be the true test. But I do think that it eases the pain a little bit that they have such a strong running back to lean on. So we'll see if that'll ultimately be, ultimately be the deciding factor because Saskatchewan has a stud of a quarterback, too, and Drew Burko, right? So we'll see. Those Calgary Dinos did defeat the Regina Rams 34-27. Calgary, of course, improved to 2-0 in the game. Um, just quickly, though, on Regina, Cayman Shutter, he played college football at Hawaii, and we talked about Will Finch earlier. Is Cayman Shutter a quarterback that could potentially make an impact in the CFL as well? Well, here's the thing. He sure looked good uh, last game, right? 404 yards, two touchdowns on the Calgary Dinos. I mean, are you kidding me? Right? And he, he seemed to find a favorite receiver of his in Colton Solomon, who had 104 yards touchdown. I think, I, you know, I like the way they develop quarterbacks in the Canada West. Uh, I think uh, it's difficult to say. I mean, really, I, I want to say yes, but, I mean, it just we don't see it often, right? So if guys like uh, Kyle Quinlan can't make it in the CFL or Danny Brannigan, even though he was shorter, right, it just it makes you think, can these guys actually do it? With Finch, I, I strongly believe that he has as strong a chance as anyone. With this kid, I need to see more from him before I make a decision, but the odds are obviously, you know, heavily stacked against him, but I would love to see it. And rounding out the conference play in the Canada West, UBC in overtime defeated Alberta 39-36. Moving on to the top ten, it was released today. Laval stayed number one. Queens remained in number two. Western moved up from number four to number three, which dropped Montreal from three to four. Calgary stayed in number five. Saskatchewan moved up from eight to six with their win over Manitoba. Guelph stayed at number seven. They were on a bye this past week. They are currently two and zero. Manitoba moved up despite the loss from nine to eight. McMaster dropped from six to nine on strength back to back losses. And St. Mary's with their win over Acadia moved up into the top ten. And James, I wanted to ask you uh, about the top ten. Is there any changes that you would have made for this past week? Well, not necessarily. I mean, if you look at the 1-4, I think you could reorder those first four teams any way you want. I mean, who's better, Queens or Western? They had a common opponent in McMaster. Western blew a mo. Queens maybe should have lost. But, I mean, that's all subjective too, right? Laval hasn't looked as dominant as they usually look, at least on offense. Their defense has been amazing. Montreal's blowing teams out. The one thing that I think is interesting in this uh, top ten that I want to point out is that, like I said, the pollsters haven't overreacted to McMaster losing two games to the second and third ranked team. They still have them in the top ten. So uh, I, I think that was good by them. But everything else to me seems seems like it should be. Now, one more question before I let you go here, and that is Vanya Kep. Do you have a mm-hmm. prediction here early in the season? What's what's going to happen? Oof. Well, you're really putting me on the spot, eh? 
<laughs> you know, I, I think there are a lot of teams that have looked really good. Uh, if I had to pick one team right now, you know, I, I'd say, you know, to be the champs, you have to beat the champs. So until somebody beats Laval, uh, I don't see how you take it away from them, even though other teams have looked good. So if, you, if you're asking me for a pick at this moment in time, I would say Laval. All right, James Katsuris, uh, Sports A, Deputy Chief Editor. You can follow him on Twitter, at J Katsuris, J-K-A-T-S-U-A, sorry, J-K-A-T-S-U-R-A-S, at Sports A as well. James, thank you so much for doing this and being a part of our CIS coverage today. Tyler, it was my pleasure. Thank you very much. There he is, James Katsiris, as I mentioned, Sports A. a fantastic CIS segment from him. Uh, Laval. He's picking Laval. They've been to the Vanier Cup countless times over the past few years, and he's picking them again. And so we're going to move on into the CJFL here, and that brings in my next guest. He is Ryan Waters, and he is the Director of Communications for the Canadian Junior Football League. Ryan, how are you doing this evening? Good. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Um, so we're going to start here in the PFC, the Prairie Football Conference, and uh, I was just talking to our last guest, James Katsuris, of an interesting decision by Brian Taurus in the Huskies and Bisons game, and that led me to ask you a question here about a decision that was made with the Regina Thunder and the Saskatoon Hilltops. The Thunder beat the Hilltops 29-28 in the game, but the Hilltops led by six points late and they went for it on third and one late in the game, trying to seal the game. The Thunder stopped them and went on to win. Now, what's your take on a coach like Tom Sargent, who has won countless times at the national level here? What's your take on that decision? Never question him. <laughs> I mean, you're right. I mean, he, he has won countless championships. They're three-time Canadian Bowl champions. Uh, it's second guess a guy like that. Uh, he's a terrific head coach, and uh, he gambled. And unfortunately for the Hilltops, didn't pay off. But I give a lot of credit to the Regina Thunder. I mean, they're down, well, like you said, by six. There's 38 seconds to go. They're in Saskatoon. They're at the Gordy Bowl. Uh, they're against the defending champs. And I give a lot of credit to that defense. They were able to shut down the Hilltops there on the third and one. Uh, they get the ball back. A couple of seconds later, they throw for a touchdown. So, uh, you know, it, it's pretty amazing. But, uh, you know, I, I'm not going to second guess uh, Coach Sargent because he has the uh, the credentials behind him to uh, make whatever decision he wants to make, and uh, you know, no nothing nothing bad said against Coach Sargent. Other scores in the PFC: Winnipeg defeated Calgary 34-18, Edmonton Wildcats over the Edmonton Huskies 50-18. to Ryan, is what are your thoughts on the PFC early here? Is Sask- Saskatoon who's going to challenge them this year? Well, they're, obviously they're the team to beat until somebody knocks them off. But, uh, I mean, you look at the Edmonton Huskies. They come out of the gate 3-0. and Now, they did lose against the Wildcats, their crosstown rival, uh, big 50-18, to as you alluded to. The Wildcats getting 690 offensive yards, which is pretty amazing, uh, 353 of it, which on the ground by one guy. Uh, but the Huskies, I think, they're the real deal. Uh, they had a terrible UC season last year. They've come out of the gate flying here. Uh, the Wildcats, and you can never count out this Regina Thunder team. Last year they surprised everybody. Uh, by making it to the PSC final. Uh, but I think they have what it takes to uh, to certainly challenge the Hilltops we saw this past weekend when they beat Saskatoon in Saskatoon. So the Thunder is certainly a team to look out for, but uh, also keep your eye on the Edmonton Huskies. Moving on to the BC Football Conference, the Vancouver Island Raiders, 45-17 win over the Okanagan Sun. The Langley Rams were victors over the West Shore Rebels, 49-17, and Kamloops Broncos defeated the Valley Huskers, 25-20. Now, next week here, coming up, the Langley Rams and VI Raiders are going to play again. Um, are they heading towards a clash in the BCFC final for another time? Not necessarily. Uh, the Okanagan Sun have played very well. Their record is 4-2 and two right now, but one of those losses was an overturned game, uh, an overturned score by the BCFC uh, due to an ineligible player. Uh, the Sun have gone to an appeal. Uh, it's now in a professional arbitrator's hands, which actually the appeal went through today. Uh, so the arbitrator will now rule whether the score will stand and the Sun keep their record of 4-2 and two, or they go into a 5-1 and one situation. If they do, 
five and one, they will take sole possession of first place in the BC Football Conference uh, because they beat the Langley Rams, did the Sun by a score. It was a barn burner, 29 to 28 before the Labor Day long weekend by. So, uh, and those two teams don't play each other again. So if it comes down to a tie, Langley and Okanagan, Okanagan would have the tiebreaker and home field advantage throughout the 2013 postseason. So uh, you got to throw the Sun into the mix as well when you talk about the Rams and the Raiders. Uh, Raiders certainly proved uh, their, their flexed their muscle, I guess you could say, this past weekend, beating the Sun by the score of 45-17, as you mentioned. So uh, those three, it's a three-horse race, essentially, between the Raiders, the Rams, and the Sun. It has been for the last number of years. So it'll be fun to watch the rest of the way. The Raiders and Rams coming up this weekend, which will be at Denny, uh, and I do believe they play one more time. That one will be in Langley. So uh, those two teams will will uh, certainly duke it out for the top first or second position. Now you mentioned the three horse race: the Raiders, the Rams, the Sun. Is when are we going to see a challenge? Is is there going to is it going to be a few years down the road here? Is it coming up fairly quickly? Maybe in the next year or two? When is there going to be a challenge towards those three teams? If there's ever going to be a challenge. Well, I think there will be. I think the conference continues to grow. Uh, the West Shore Rebels, they're having an off year this year, but last year they finished 7-3. and three. Uh, That team is a very good football team. Uh, they have a brand-new head coach who got in late. So when you get in a little bit later, uh, it is tough to get your guys ready to go as they're uh, thinking they're preparing to have a, a, another head coach where he steps down due to family reasons, uh, a new guy steps in. So it takes the team to gel a little bit uh, to get their the legs under them, if you will, and uh, Victoria and the island is so strong as far as high school football goes and, and those kinds of programs, the midget programs. So I think the Raider or the Ra- uh, Rebels, pardon me, are on the right path and they have Tim Kearse. He's a former CFLer. He's the head coach now. I think they're, they're going to challenge the, the Sun, the Raiders and the Rams here in the next uh, year and or, or so. So, uh, it, it will continue to grow and you can't never count out this, the Valley Huskers and the, and the Camelish Broncos. I mean, Camelish is such a wonderful place to play at Hillside Stadium on the campus of Thompson Rivers University. they got a lot of players that are interested in continuing their, their schooling and what better way to play at Thompson Rivers and then also attend it. So, uh, and, and the Valley Huskers, they've had the, a tough go the last few years, but they have the right guy at the helm right now in Tyson St. James, another former CFLer. Uh, he's at the helm with the Huskers, and they have made leaps and bounds growth in the last year, in the last 12 months. So, uh, you know, I, I think in the next two years, I think all teams will be on a level playing field, and it should be very fun in the BC Football Conference. Moving on to the Ontario Football Conference, and a battle of unbeatens didn't didn't come out to be such a battle as Hamilton defeated Windsor 36-3. to And how surprising was it for you in a battle of unbeatens that a result like that would come out? I am, I am kind of surprised. I, I'm kind of surprised. And it was in Windsor, which is even more surprising. But the Hurricanes, it's a real deal. This team is very, very good. They're very well coached. Uh, and they got some veteran leadership on the defensive side. And as you know, defense wins championships. And when you can shut out a team pretty much and just allow them a field goal, and they're one of the top teams in the O as well, I mean, that, that speaks volumes right there. And this Hamilton team, watch out for them. They're very scary. This team is going to host, or the, pardon me, the conference is going to host the national semifinal game. And in late October, uh, they'll host the BC Conference champions. So uh, they're making a push. They are making a push to the Canadian Bowl, and why not? And Hamilton is certainly the class of the conference right now. The St. Leonard Cougars, uh, they're right there as well. And you never can count out the Ottawa Sooners, uh, who did start slowly. They also started slowly last year and, and strung together quite a few wins to make the postseason. So it's going to be another uh, barn burner, I think. It is only an eight-week season. And we're heading into week number uh, five here. So it'll be good. It'll be fun to watch. Other scores in the OFC. London defeated the Predators Football Club 30-17. to Ottawa was over Burlington 29-7. And St. Leonard was over the GTA Bears 29 to nothing. Uh, Ryan, we're, we're stretched right up against the time here. Uh, I want to thank you so much for joining me for our CJFL segment here. Is, are you on Twitter? And where can our listeners follow you? Well, for the CJFL, certainly on Twitter at CJFL News, and my Twitter link is uh, at Ryan Two Ts Waters. There he is, Ryan Waters. Thank you so much, Ryan. Take care. Ryan Waters, Director of Communications, Canadian Junior Football League. That is going to do it for our CIS CJFL segment. Thank you again to James Katsuris, Sports A, Ryan Waters. 
Director of Communication CJSL. Those were two fantastic guests here on the CIS CJSL show. That's going to do it for this segment. I'm Tyler Bieber. Thank you for listening to Rouge Radio. Good Wednesday evening, Canada. How are we doing tonight? My name is Tyler Bieber, the host of Rouge Radio, and I thank you, as always, for joining me for tonight's CFL show. And I hope you are as excited as I am. We have been hyping this up since we learned the news, and joining me tonight on Rouge Radio is the current record holder for the most consecutive field goals made in a row at 39. He is the all-star place kicker for the Calgary Stampeders, and he is, of course, Rene Paredes. And uh, it's interesting to note the career path of Paredes as he started out in training camp with the Winnipeg Blue Bombers in 2010. He returned to school that year to Concordia for his senior season with the Stingers before coming back and re-signing with the Blue Bombers for training camp the following season. He was released. Uh, the team elected to keep Justin Pilardi, who, of course, they recently released in favor of Sandro DeAngelis. And uh, Paredes broke Paul McCallum's consecutive field goals record in Winnipeg against the Blue Bombers earlier this season. And so we'll ask him how it felt and uh, if there's any extra gratification about breaking the record on a team that passed on him. Or, of course, if he was just happy to break the record and continue on with the season that the Calgary Stampeders have had, they sit 8-2 and two tied with the Saskatchewan Rough Riders after some help this past Sunday from the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. How about that? A fantastic defensive performance from Casey Crehan's defense in Winnipeg there. Now, Paradise got his chance with the Calgary Stampeders due to an injury to Rob Maver in the first week of the 2011 season. And Maver was lost for the season that year after scoring the most points in the league during his rookie campaign in 2010. So we're going to ask him about that situation and how it has worked out so well for the organization as the tandem is quite arguably the best kicker-punter combo in the entire league. And following our chat with Renee, we're going to dive into the action from this past week with a recap of things going on around the league, as well as a a little bit of a preview of a CIS and CFL segment upcoming next week. With uh, We're going to have Kent Ridley on the show, and he's going to help us recap the top 15 released by the Scouting Bureau today for May's draft. And we're going to have a little bit of a preview with that, give you the top 15 that was released. And Kent is, as always, a remarkable remarkable guy to talk to when it comes to CIS and things like that. And we're going to have him on next week here. Um, a little bit of CFL discussion before we bring on Renee here. Rematches of the Banjo Bowl. And it's always interesting to see how the rematch between Calgary and Edmonton goes. Because they play on the Monday, the Labor Day game. And then the CFL for the past 25 years has scheduled them that same week on the Friday. And many are starting to wonder if perhaps that kind of situation is a little bit too daunting for a professional football team that just four days after you have what was probably the craziest game in the entire league this season, that was the Labor Day game where Edmonton nearly came back on the Stampeders. And uh, these guys, you know, they're professionals. They're human beings, too. They get, they're going to get worn down. They're going to get tired. And that could lead to some serious injuries. And more often than not, let's be honest, it doesn't create the best game as they are playing on that short week. So this past Friday, Calgary defeated the Edmonton Eskimos 22-12. to Rene Paredes, 5-5 in the game. First kicker this season to hit from 50 yards out. It was attempted earlier this season by Grant Shaw of the Edmonton Eskimos. It was a final play of the game, actually, against the Hamilton Tiger Cats. And Shaw missed the field goal, so Paredes became the first kicker this season to hit a field goal from 50 yards. His counterpart, Hugh O'Neill, struggled, missed a couple short field goals that could have helped impact the game, of course. He was one for three in the game. Uh, Quarterback play was okay. It wasn't anything spectacular. Bo Levi Mitchell was 19 of 26, passing for 175 yards, one touchdown, and one interception, whereas his opponent, Mike Riley, 
was 16 of 26 for 194 yards, coming off of a remarkable fourth quarter where he threw for four touchdown passes in that comeback effort against the Calgary Stampeders on Labor Day. John Cornish doing what John Cornish does, of course, 14 carries, 131 yards. He also led the game for the Calgary Stampeders in receiving at six receptions for 46 yards and one touchdown. So Calgary, 8-2, and two, despite their troubles, they're still tied, now tied with the Saskatchewan Rough Riders after the Winnipeg Blue Bombers beat the Riders this past Sunday. And we've said it before, it's it's remarkable to see what John Huffnagel has been able to do with that Calgary team. It doesn't seem to matter who goes down. They find a way to win. And it's that next man up mentality that so many teams are starting to use that you have these guys who are behind the starters, yes, but they can fill in and they can be equally as impactive as some of these players. And Calgary, it's just amazing, 8-2. and two. On Saturday, it was Hamilton against BC. BC clipped them in the Labor Day game. A non-traditional Labor, Labor Day game at that, as it's usually Hamilton against Toronto in this situation, but stadium issues didn't make it so this year. Uh, Hamilton won that game 37-29. It was a it was a very slow first quarter, 3-2 Hamilton led. Game picked up a little bit in the second quarter as Hamilton led 17-8 at the half. And then they ran away with the game for a little bit there in the third quarter as they outscored BC 17 to nothing, And they led 34-8 to at home to the BC Lions. But BC wasn't about to go away. A 21-point fourth quarter, and... It was an eight-point game in the end. Henry Burris, as Henry Burris does, spreading the ball around to his receivers. A 12th straight game where he's thrown the ball to at least seven targets in a single game. That is absolutely fantastic, and it's even a little bit more so fantastic when you when you think of what happened on Sunday with Justin Goltz of the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. He threw passes to just three players. Three players caught passes. He completed eight passes in the game something that you think would be incredibly difficult to do, especially on a CFL field where it's so wide open and it's such a pass-driven league. And uh, just eight completions, three receivers, and that was the first time since 2001 when Reggie Slack of the Toronto Argonauts completed three passes to, or sorry, three passes to three receivers in a game that they won 24-8. to eight. Travis Lule, he was all right. 26-43, 334 yards, two touchdowns. It was his second straight game of over 300 yards. He seems to be finding a little bit of a little bit of a mojo now with that BC Lions offense, and uh, they still are lacking an Andrew Harris presence on that team, though. He had five carries in the game. Travis Lule ran the ball more than Andrew Harris did. How strange is that? How wrong is that? The quarterback should not be running the ball more than your star running back. And, you know, I I don't know what they're doing. And Andrew Harris said it himself. He came out and said it himself. He doesn't know if the coaches think that he can't do it. Is the confidence there? Is the confidence lost? Who knows? But right now, Andrew Harris just is not getting the football. And it, it's so mind-boggling because he was step-for-step step with John Cornish last season in the race for the outstanding Canadian and in the race for yards records as Canadian running backs. And, you know, it, it, it just boggles the mind as to what they're trying to do in BC. On Sunday, there was a doubleheader. Toronto Argonauts and Montreal Alouettes. They played a little bit of a sleeper game on Tuesday and uh, a, a much better game. Despite a slower first half, it was 16-5 to Montreal led after the first half. But Toronto, Zach Kolarosi bounced back. He threw a little bit of a bad interception in the first half, but he was able to get his feet under him and collect himself and bounce back the way a young quarterback needs to bounce back. He dusted off any any doubts that he may have had about himself, and he, he picked up his confidence, and he was able to sling the ball in the second half very well. Uh, Toronto scored 32 points in that second half as they won 37-30. Claros was 30 of 43 in the game for 336 yards, two touchdowns, and one interception. And, uh, you know, it looked like perhaps he, he was a little bit rushing his throws. Montreal blitzed like crazy in that game. 
it seemed almost every player, at least every second play, they were throwing the blitz at a, at a young quarterback, and sometimes that's the best way to go about it. But in the second half, Claros was able to get the ball out a little bit, a little bit faster, and was able to beat that defense and get the win. Tanner Marsh, he started out well, but his mistakes came in the second half as they did against the BC Lions. Now they beat the BC Lions, but he still threw four interceptions in that game. He threw three interceptions in this past game and uh, struggled in the second half. Montreal scored 14 points, and they just could not find a way. And Jerome Messam, who had such a crucial role for the team over the, over the past two wins, seven carries for 12 yards. Again, a situation where you're not using the running back the way that he necessarily needs to be used. And while Jerome Messam, I don't think, is in the same you know, region as an Andrew Harris, they still got to get the running back the ball and help out a young quarterback, and I don't think that they, they did that very well. And then, of course, moving on to the Sunday game, the Winnipeg Blue Bombers, despite not having a first down in the entire first half, defeated the Saskatchewan Rough Riders 25-13 for the first win at Investors Group Field. How fantastic was that for the Winnipeg Blue Bombers, and especially their defensive coordinator, Casey Crehan, who has come under a ton of heat for the way his defense has performed. But they stepped up. They blitzed like crazy. Safety blitzes, corner blitzes, halfback blitzes, anything you could draw up in the playbook, they did it. And they sacked Darian Durant eight times in the game, which was nearly a team record. Team record is nine that they did in 1984, but eight times in the game. Saskatchewan still gained him, though, 219 to 183. And like I mentioned, no first downs in the first half for the Winnipeg Blue Bombers, but it was a kick return by Will Ford. He bobbled the kick return, strangely enough, but that extra second that he needed to pick up the ball may have made all the difference as it allowed his blockers to form those blocks and help him spring free down the field. And It'll be interesting to see going forward as they have a back-to-back here with the Edmonton Eskimos coming up, what the Winnipeg Blue Bombers are going to be able to do. Because Edmonton has been close to winning so many games, and yet they just haven't been able to. And they now sit in the basement at 1-9 and nine with the Winnipeg win as the Bombers are now 2-8. and eight. But a back-to-back coming up, and it'll be interesting to see how those games go. So, Rene Paredes on the program tonight, and we're going to try and get a hold of him here. You'll have to bear with me here as I'm new to this setup here, dialing out. I think we have to actually dial on the program here, so we're going to give it a shot here. You have reached the voice mailbox of... Okay, so Rene is a little bit busy right now. That's fine. We can continue on with our CFL discussion, and we'll try again in a little bit with Rene Paredes. Of course, being a professional athlete, you're always busy, and so we'll give him another shot a little bit later here. And we're going to go back to this Calgary-Edmonton game. And uh, the Calgary Stampeders, as I mentioned, they just keep finding a way to win. And Ottawa is coming up in the draft here in the expansion draft, and they're going to be looking for a quarterback. They get two, and then the third one or fourth one or however many they want to have on their roster, they're going to have to pick up along the way in free agency and whatnot. But the discussion all along has been, what is Calgary going to do? Are they going to go for Bo Levi Mitchell, who has showed his talents in a couple of wins here, defeating the Edmonton Eskimos and earlier the Winnipeg Blue Bombers? Are they going to go for Drew Tate? Now, Drew Tate has had an injury history, so I don't really think that a franchise that is trying to establish some ground, some early ground and get going and get in the win column early is going to go after a guy who has an injury history like Drew Tate has. And then, of course, the other option is the veteran, Kevin Glenn. 
Now, Kevin Glenn's a personal favorite of mine, and I will admit that, and I'm not afraid to admit that. But uh, I don't know if you go for the veteran guy like that. Maybe you go for him as a backup like Kevin Glenn would be normally if all things were equal in Calgary with Drew Tate starting and Glenn would be the backup. But uh, I don't think you want to go – you may want to – you may not want to go in that direction when you're starting out on the franchise going with the veteran guy. But then again, you're trying to get wins, right, ne- not necessarily develop a team. Of course, you want to develop that team, but you also want to get in the win column as early as possible because last time Ottawa was in the CFL with the Ottawa Renegades, they struggled to find some wins and uh, just couldn't get going. You know, And four years later, they, they, of course, folded, and a dispersal draft came about, and some teams benefited more than others. Of course, the Saskatchewan Rough Riders picked up Kerry Joseph, Jason Armstead, and they were able to go on and win the Great Cup the following year in 2007 with Kerry Joseph as the star quarterback and the league's most outstanding player. Um, a situation that I think may occur, and it's a little bit interesting, there's been word that Henry Burris may be a free agent after this season, and uh, I'm not 100% sure on his contract status, and that's simply because the CFL likes to keep that information close to them, and they don't really like to spread that out, which is another topic when it comes to contract status. In the NFL, for example, you can look and you can find just about anything you want, whether it's the length of the contract or, you know, the salary that a a guy makes. And um, it just doesn't happen that way in the CFL for whatever reason. Now, I've been told in the past that perhaps it's a club decision and it seems to be that way. But, uh, you know, it's it's just not that way in the CFL for whatever reason. Now, perhaps down the road it may get to that point, but at the moment it is what it is. Uh, as I was mentioning, a situation I think may happen, Dan LaFever, backup quarterback of the Hamilton Tiger Cats. Now, he's a guy that I have watched for years now, whether it's in the NFL with the Chicago Bears or in college. And I'm I'm a big fan of Dan Lefevre, and I think he's shown us what he can do in the early going here in separate packages. Henry Burris is, of course, the starter, and he's going to be the starter for the rest of the season unless, of course, an injury happens. But Dan Lefevre has done a tremendous job for the Hamilton Tiger Cats in terms of, you know, dealing with what he is given, and that is making the most of the situation throwing for touchdowns, rushing for touchdowns. He even caught a touchdown pass from Andrea Jones. And I think Dan LaFever is one guy that Ottawa is going to look at closely. And again, it's going to be interesting because if Henry Burris is a free agent, Ottawa could supposedly go after Henry Burris and then Hamilton would protect Dan LaFever and Dan LaFever would be the starting quarterback for the Hamilton Target Cats in the 2014 season. But if Henry Burris does re-sign with Hamilton or he is not in his final contract year, then will Dan Lefevre be open? And I think if Dan Lefevre is open, that Ottawa would be wise to go after him. And then that also factors in other young quarterbacks, such as Zach Caleros of the Toronto Argonauts, uh, Tanner Marsh of the Montreal Alouettes. They've shown a little bit here and there. Marsh, of course, has made more mistakes than the young quarterbacks in the league. But Caleros is one guy who made an impact right away and people felt that he could be that Ottawa quarterback right away. And, of course, it, it, it just doesn't work out that you start one game and then all of a sudden you're the greatest quarterback to ever play the game. It's just not going to work that way. And these guys need more grooming, whether they throw for 300 yards in a game and go with a 5-3 and three record or a 6-2 and two record or whatnot. And if, they, if they're like a Tanner Marsh throwing 13 passes, complete on 28 attempts and three interceptions or four interceptions as he did against the BC Lions. They're young quarterbacks. They're going to make mistakes. They're going to make the plays, but they still have to be groomed. And again, it'll be interesting to see where Ottawa goes. Of course, the other quarterback there is Drew Willie. Drew Willie of the Saskatchewan Rough Riders. And uh, will he factor in? He has a little bit of NFL experience. He learned from Peyton Manning, actually, in Indianapolis. So it'll be interesting to see what happens there. And now I'm told 
by our producer, Jason Sperling, that Rene Paradis is ready to join us. So I'm going to dial out here and just give us a couple seconds and we'll we'll get going here. Hello. Hello, Rene. Hey, how you doing? Good, how are you? Good, good, good. Sorry about that. No, no problems at all. I understand being a professional athlete that you are, that you you may have other commitments. But uh, welcome to Rouge Radio, and uh, thank you for joining me tonight. How are you doing? I'm pretty good. Uh, how about yourself? I'm doing quite well. I was just doing a recap of the games from this past week, and uh, you became the first kicker to hit a field goal from 50 yards this season. It had only been attempted one other time this season. But uh, I was curious to know what your thoughts are. When it comes to kicking the long field goals, maybe something right. you've heard from your coaches in meetings or whatnot, but why have we not seen kickers attempting these 50-yard field goals this season? I mean, uh, throughout the league, you know, uh, you know, people, uh, they've been saying that uh, they don't want to kick the long ones because last year we had so many returns and such stuff. I mean, through in, in our team, I think uh, it hasn't been because of that. If we haven't had the chance to really, um, you know, Hub does a great job uh, to to make those decisions uh, for the better of the team. Um, you know, I had a 50 yard, I had a chance for a 50 yarder, and we needed those three points to go up by seven. So I mean, Hub said, Let, "Let's go for it," and, you know, and I had the opportunity, which I was very glad to. Now, I think you make a good point there because your first field goal attempt with Calgary in 2011 was actually from 50 yards, and you've, right. you've clearly shown your head coach, John Huffnagel, that you right. can make these pressure-packed kicks over the years. So I think you're you're fairly accurate in that regard. And uh, speaking of your first time with the Calgary Stampeders, you actually started out with the Winnipeg Blue Bombers in training camp there in 2011, and they let you go to keep Justin Pilardi. Now, when you broke the record for consecutive field goals earlier this season. It was against Winnipeg. And right. I was wondering if you had a little extra satisfaction breaking the record against a team that passed on you, or if, you know, you felt that you're happy to get a record in the CFL, you're happy to move on, you're happy to win a game and keep going with the season. Right. Uh, I'm not going to lie. You know, it was it was a little of a satisfaction, you know, uh, uh, if that would happen to anybody, I'm sure they would tell you the same thing. Um, you know, it, it's, that's the way it turned out, funny as it is. Um, you know, the the game before, I had a chance to tie it, and unfortunately, it got blocked, and so and so all the stuff. But I mean, I had nothing against the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. You know, they know that. I I talked to Lapo two weeks ago when I saw him in Toronto, and we talked about it. You know. Uh, you know, it is it is what it is. Um, I feel I never get the 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 chance when I was in Winnipeg that I wanted, and and I told myself um, whenever I had the next opportunity, you know, I was going to take full advantage, and that's what I did when I got to Calgary. You know, they gave me a, a 50 yarder as my first kick, and I made it. So and and that's what I did. You know, I, I took full advantage. And I'm still taking uh, advantage of it. Now, how hard exactly is it to hit 39 field goals in a row? Oh man, <laughs> you know it's it's very hard. You know the first the first 20, the, the like the media, um, everybody doesn't talk about it. You, you know it's there, and. They don't talk about it until you get to like 23, 24, 25. And then that's when you get the pressure from the media, uh, friends, um, you know, also all those type, uh, type of stuff. Um, you know, I think it's, it's really hard to do. You know, uh, I'm pretty sure any kicker, any kicker will tell you that. Um, you know, Chris Melo right now is at 27. He's doing a great job. I'm very happy for him. And, you know, it's 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 a very tough thing. Is is you know, I'm proud of myself for what I accomplished and even though I missed a twenty two yarder, you know, I I keep my head up. You know, it's something that w we'll see if I if I have a chance to uh do it again. 
Now, going back to your first season with Calgary, you were successful that season in hitting 35 field goals on 45 attempts. And then the next year in 2012, you were, you hit 40 field goals on 43 attempts. And, right. you know, just describe to our listeners what kind of a process a kicker goes through in the off season, leading up to and then throughout the next season and even into this past season that helps you improve so much year after year. Right. Um, you know, every kicker is different. You know the way the way I, I took it was, you know, the first thing I did it was call Don Sweet. Um, I started working with him uh, towards the end of the off season and around April, and you know I think that was the biggest thing for me. Um, he's a great coach. Um, I owe him a lot uh, to what he's done to my kicking game. You know, Rob Maver worked with him too in the off season for the past two years. And he you know he was an all star last year. He's he's gonna be an all star this year again, I think. And you know Chris Milo, he worked with him for the first time this off season, and now he's 27 for 27. So I think I think Don Sweet was the biggest thing. You know, like I said, every kicker uh, has a different appro- approach. Uh, what I do, I make sure I, I don't kick until April. Um, I make sure I get my legs strong, and and then once I start in April slowly get into it now this next question i have for you is something that perhaps a kicker wouldn't be asked too often and it's more suited towards a quarterback or a receiver or something like that but i'm curious to hear your thoughts and it's uh do you think that over the course of your career or even this season or you know your persona connecting with the fans signing autographs and whatnot when it comes to young kids getting into football do you think that you can help influence what position they play um, obviously most kids set out wanting to be the star quarterback or the receiver or the linebacker. And with the way the game has shaped, I think kickers have gradually become more and more important over the course of time, kicking pressure packed field goals again, as you did on this past Friday with the 50 yarder. Um, is it something that you strive to achieve in wanting to be a role model for young athletes? And then they look at the TV screen and think, Hey, that number 30 for the Calgary Stampeders is pretty good. And I think I want to be a kicker and, you know, model my, my football career after him oh definitely you know like i i really hope people look up to me and 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 i want to be kickers you know most of the first thing they do is that yeah i want to be a quarterback i want a running back or a receiver but it doesn't turn out that way for that many people um you know when when i'm i'm practicing and then you have a you know schools come to practice and they they see me kick 30 yards 40 yards they seem impressed. They 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 see how how cool it is uh, to kick a football. So I mean, you know, once they're young, they er, 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 everything's exciting for them. And hopefully, like you know, if they become kickers, uh, hopefully I influence them. If they become run, uh, running backs or quarterbacks, uh, it will be great. And you mentioned it there. Uh, we see so often that quarterbacks or offensive linemen, they convert their positions, they become receivers or maybe defensive linemen. And, you know, just as you mentioned, lending out that extra hand and perhaps if being a quarterback doesn't work out, they become a kicker. And it, right. I think it's great that kickers are wanting to see young kids become kickers and you're not going to, tr- you're not going to give up in trying to make that happen because, you know, Kickers are a huge part of the game, whether people believe it or not. So, right. uh, so, so much of the time, even if it doesn't come down to a last-second play, a kicker is going to factor in whether it's a miss or a make, and we've seen it time and time again, even this 2013 CFL season. And uh, now getting to the current roster on the Calgary Stampeders, I wanted to ask you how tough it is right. to see injuries start to pile up and see veterans like Dimitri Sumpas, Nick Lewis go down for the year. And uh, your locker room is obviously quite unique in that despite all the injuries, the leadership is still there. The team has still remained competitive. You're still winning. You're eight and two. Um, Describe to us the feeling that you get when you see such a tremendous player, a perennial all-star like Nick Lewis go down with the injury that he did. Right. Um, I mean, it's, it's very tough, you know, from, from half all the way down to to the players, it's tough to see that. But I mean, um, if somebody gets hurt, you know, our motto is okay. Next guy has to step up. Um, 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 Hoffnagel and and John Murphy 
have done a great job the past two years of bringing guys to come in and compete and and help our team. Um, last year we had uh, I don't know uh, about ten ACL surgeries, and and whoever came in did a great great job and to help us get to a great cup. Uh, this year has been the same thing. You know our, our locker room is is full. We we have like a training camp roster right now, but I mean every player that comes in and and helps us win is doing a great job, and that comes from the the GM and head coach. So um, it's it's tough to see, but at the same time we we have to move on. We have to keep competing and make sure we do our job. Now this ties into the next the next question here. And Rob Maver was injured in week one of the 2011 season when the Stampeders brought you in. And right. some thought that it might be on a little bit of an interim basis, you know, just for the season because Rob Maver led the league in total points for kickers right. in the, his rookie season in 2010. And uh, I think it's worked out best for all parties involved. And I'm sure you're going to agree oh, with me that Rob Maver, Rob Maver has developed into the league's best punter. And uh, how remarkable of a job – I, you just touched on it a little bit, but uh, John Huffnagel, John Murphy, you know, amazing jobs that they have done. And uh, speak to your teammate, Rob Maver, a little bit. Uh, w- does he work with you in the off season as well in getting better and becoming the best punter in the league as he has? Oh, you know, me, me, you know, I live in Montreal. He lives in here in Calgary. But we talk almost every day. You know, we, we, we have become very good friends. Um, I know what he's doing the off season. He knows what I'm doing. We make sure to to get better at the same time. Even though we're not in the same city, we uh, we talk about getting better. Um, this off season, what we did is I flew to BC before the training camp, and he he flew too, and we met up with Don Sui at the same time, and we worked out for three four days right before training camp to make sure that we're ready to go. Rob Maver, uh, is, he's a great guy. We become very good friends. And I believe he's become the best punter in this league. Um, he may not, he may not have the strongest leg, uh, compared to Swayze, I mean, uh, Schmidt from Saskatchewan. But, I mean, he does the job. If, if you tell him to put in inside the 10, he'll put inside the 10. If you want, if you want a 55 yard field goal, uh, punt, he'll give it to you. Um, he works hard at, at what he does, and he's going. He's going to have a great career. And to that point about putting it inside the ten yard line, Rob Maver does in fact lead the league in pinning opponents inside the twenty, and he right. has actually only hit it into the end zone twice this season, and that's for a right. CFL CFL uh, punter. That's truly remarkable. Um, just back to your field goal streak now. Unfortunately, it did end on a 22-yard field goal. And how tough was it for you to know that the streak ended on a 22-yard field goal? And I'm sure you'd agree, a kick that you probably should have made. Oh, definitely. You know, uh, I know, I knew, I knew that the streak had to end at some point, right? Um, right. I, I was, I was really mad and upset at myself. It ended on a 22-yarder. Um, you know, as as a kicker, you you have a you need to have a short memory. Um, you gotta move on. And, you know, my next kick was a 42 yarder that we needed, and and I made it. I mean, you you can't let it affect you. Um, I moved on from it. Uh, you know, uh, I'm not gonna lie. To this day, I still think about it. And but like I said, you gotta move on. And you know, I I start a new streak and hopefully uh, get to the point again. And uh, again, to that point, the the guy you passed, Paul McCallum, in right. 2004 in the playoffs, he missed an 18 yard field goal for the Saskatchewan Roughriders that may have right. helped send them to the Great Cup. And yeah. just the his ability to bounce back, you know, he's a two time Great Cup champion now, and uh, it, it's just incredible how he had bounced back and how you bounced right back from missing a 22 yard field goal, and you have not missed another kick this season. Uh, now, last question before I let you go, and it's gonna be a little bit of an interesting question, I think. And if it comes down to it in November in Regina right. for the 101st Great Cup game, and I know being a team guy, you may not say it matters either way, but would you rather be the guy 
down two points. It's the final play. Would you rather kick the 47-yard field goal for the win, or would you rather see a comfortable, say, 14-point lead on the strength of a great game overall as a team? Uh, you know, I got asked that that qu- same question last year at the Grey Cup. Um, you know, uh, everybody, and you want to win, right? Uh, it doesn't matter how you win. Uh, if I get put in a situation to to hit a win- game-winning field goal, I'm going to be ready. I'm going to take it as as any other kick. But at the same time, you know, you don't want to put the stress on on your teammates, yourself, uh, and the rest of the the the, the city who who who's representing you know the Grey Cup. But like I said, if it comes down to me, uh, I'll, I'll I'll be ready. Uh, hopefully, it doesn't. Hopefully, we we. Uh, we get the big lead when there's no stress in the last two minutes. But you never know. It's, it's the great cup. The the best two teams are are playing for 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 the championship, and it's most likely it's gonna end up being a, a two minute uh, game. So, it, but like I said before, um, if it if it comes down to me, uh, I'll be ready. Record breaking. All-star kicker, Rene Paredes, thank you so much for joining me this evening. I, I appreciate you taking the time out to talk to us and our listeners here on Rouge Radio, and I wish you all the best this season in chasing that ring and, and rolling along here as the playoffs come. I appreciate it, guys. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, it was a pleasure, and uh hope to hear from you guys again. All right. Thank you so much again. Take care. There he is. How about that? Rene Paredes, kicker, Calgary Stampeders. That was fantastic. Um, so as I was mentioning earlier, the CFL Scouting Bureau released their top 15 players today. And topping the charts was an offensive lineman. He comes from McGill, the McGill Redmond, Laurent Duvernay Tardif. And the, the September rankings, you know, it's the preliminary preliminary rankings. They're always going to change. There's two more to be released, one in December after the CIS season ends, and then, of course, one prior to the draft in April. And uh, number two, Devin Bailey, a receiver out of St. Francis Xavier. Number three was David Foucault, offensive lineman of the Montreal Carabins. Number four, Pierre Lavertou, offensive lineman, Laval. Number five was Adam Thibault, a defensive back from Laval. Number six, Bo Landry, a linebacker out of Western. Seven was Max Caron, a linebacker out of Concordia, which is the alma mater of Rene Paredes. Number eight, Andrew Liu, defensive back, Queens. Nine, Sam Sabarin, a linebacker from Queens. Number 10, Queens again, Derek Wiggins, defensive lineman. Number 11, Chris Bastien, a receiver out of Concordia. Number 12 was Casey Chin, a linebacker out of Simon Fraser. 13, Kit Hillis, receiver, Saskatchewan Huskies. Had a fantastic game in their win over the Manitoba Bisons and as well has had a great season all along playing the Regina Rams upcoming this week against the Calgary Dinos. Number 14, Josh Burns, defensive back, Windsor, and rounding out the top 15 was Matthias Goosen, an offensive lineman out of Simon Fraser. And next week on the show, we're going to have Kent Ridley. He's going to break it down for us on the Tuesday's show, the CIS CJFL show. Always a great, a great guest is Kent Ridley. Of course, you can also follow him along at Ridley Scouting on Twitter, RidleyScouting.com. And he's going to break down, is there is there something that the CIS and CFL can come to that would help out the rankings here? Of course, they changed the draft format. We'll talk a little bit about that in his segment as well. And that's going to wrap it up for tonight. Rene Paredes, CFL Recap. I hope you enjoyed the show. Be sure to tune in next Tuesday. As as I mentioned, Kent really will join me. And once again, thank you for listening to Rouge Radio. I am Tyler Bieber, and you have yourself a fantastic night. Enjoy this upcoming week of CFL games. It is going to be fantastic as always. It starts out Friday. That is coming up here. Uh, the Hamilton Tiger Cats and Calgary Stampeders, Henry Burris back in Calgary again 
Winnipeg against Edmonton on Saturday, followed by Toronto-Saskatchewan in a doubleheader. The first night game of the season for Saskatchewan, 7.30 p.m. You know Mosaic Stadium is going to be rocking for Zach Kalaros and the Toronto Argonauts. And rounding out the week, Montreal at BC. Thank you again for joining me on Rouge Radio. I am am Tyler Bieber. You have yourself a fantastic evening.